What is going on everybody? It's Adam back with another video and today we are going to be checking out and implementing our own autoencoder. And you guys, autoencoders to me are just like the coolest thing. So I'm really excited to, to do this video with y'all and to show y'all how to make an autoencoder yourself. But what exactly is an autoencoder? Well, a basic Google search will tell you an autoencoder is a special type of neural network that is trained to copy its input to its output. So what does that mean? That means you got two neural networks, you got the encoder, you got the decoder, and then in the middle here, you have sort of like a compressed version of what that thing actually is, what the input is, uh, and then you use that to get the output. Now this to me, even just from a philosophical standpoint, is really interesting because you're taking something and you're compressing it to its base value, and then you're getting the output. Like for instance, you could take an image of a cat right, all the different pixels, and then say, okay, but what is the, the essence of this image? And then you compress it down to this, and then, of course, you have the decoder, which gives you the output of the image. And so this is like a way to, to compress things in an intelligent, a deep learning-driven way. And I just find it very interesting, too, because you're taking these, these big things, these big concepts, and then you're breaking them down into smaller pieces. You can think kind of like with principal component analysis, which is a more standard or old-fashioned traditional machine learning technique for taking very complex things and making them simpler. But this is just really interesting to me because it's a way of compressing things, of course, always with a little bit of loss to their, their base quality and then expanding them again. So what exactly are we going to be doing in this video? Well, in this video, we're gonna build our encoder and we're gonna build our decoder, and we're gonna be using the MNIST data set. So for those of you who don't know, MNIST is basically just a data set of a bunch of handwritten digits. And so in this case, you can see right here on the top of our screen, we have the original numbers, and then at the bottom, we have uh, after they've been encoded and then decoded, the numbers. And so you can see the autoencoder has done quite a phenomenal job of sort of getting the essence, let's say, of these numbers by the time it's decoded, which I think is really, really cool. Now, to me, what's crazy about this is that you have the original images, and the original images are represented by 28 by 28 pixels. So that comes out to 784 features, okay? 784 features, we're gonna reduce that all the way down to 10. So the dimensions go from 784, or 28 by 28, just to 10. And then from that 10, we get the results on the bottom. And of course, you can tell there's definitely some loss, specifically like with this nine, and with this five that could easily be misinterpreted for like a six or something. But overall, this is really, really good. Like, yeah, the images might look a little bit more blurry, or, or less clear, but you can really see you get the essence of the image when you go to the bottom, when it's actually being decoded. And so I think this is so cool. There are all sorts of different things that you can do with this, whether it's compression or maybe feature extraction. You wanna figure out, okay, what are the most important features in this given data set? You can use the autoencoder to say, hey, look, all this other stuff I was able to throw out and get basically the same answer. So maybe you should focus on the features that were actually being used. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for the uh, general sort of surface level explanation of how the autoencoder works. Now it's time to actually build the autoencoder. All right, so to get here, you see that I have created just an autoencoder collab notebook. And first things first, I'm gonna start with just importing all the different libraries that we're going to use. And I know it's best practice generally to do the import in the cell where you're actually using it, but just to sort of show you how few features we're actually using, I'm gonna do it all at once. So please don't get mad at me in the comments, but you can already guess the first thing that we're going to import is going to be nump. I will import that as np. Next, what we're going to do is we're gonna be using TensorFlow for the deep learning attributes of this project. So from tensorflow.keras.models. We're gonna import model. Next, we're gonna import our layers, and it looks like Colab Autocomplete has got it right. The only two layers that we're going to be using is the input layer and then the dense layer. So you see we're keeping it really simple with just basic neurons. And then for the optimizer, we're going to import atom. 
And then finally, our data set, like I said before, is the MNIST data sets, that big handwritten digit data set. So we're going to import that as well from tensorflow.keras.datasets import MNIST. Perfect. So we're going to run that, connect to the runtime. So we'll set up an X train and an X test. And we're going to set that equal to mnist.load data. All right, looks like everything's loaded. So now what we're going to do is we're going to normalize our features because right now our X train and our X test, the, the mnist load data, what we basically have is just a bunch of values between 0 and 255 to indicate the brightness of the actual pixel. Uh, we're just going to put that to 0 to 1, just feature scaling, make everything more nice for our model to actually understand what the freak is going on. So let's say X train is equal to, and you see our copilot has already completed this for us, which is awesome. We'll just make sure that these are float values. Perfect. And then let's actually check the shape of our X train and X test. So X train dot shape. X test dot shape. All right, so you see here that we have 60,000 training samples and then 10,000 testing samples. Perfect, no issue with that. But we are going to have to reshape this. So in order to do that, we're going to say X train is equal to X train dot reshape. And you see here we're going to do the length of X train, which is 6,000, length of X test, which is 10,000. And then we're going to get the product of the actual shape, so that 28 by 28. And just to kind of show you what these two lines actually did, let's again run our xtrain.shape and our xtest.shape to sort of show you what we're dealing with. And you can see all that we really did is instead of doing a 28 by 28 image, we just gave it 784 dimensions, which of course is the product of 28 and 28. So that's what that np.prod is doing. And of course you can hard code this, but just as standard practice using like length x train, length x test instead of like the actual number helps our code not break should we change something like for instance, train to test ratio, which in MNIST this train test split is kind of set by default, but should you change it, especially if you're using another database, using this length x train and this length x test is gonna help things not break. And it's the same thing regarding the dimension of the images, 28 by 28. Should you change it to 29 by 29 or 64 by 64, whatever, this np.prod is gonna make sure that uh, nothing breaks because you're not actually hard coding any values in here. But yeah, that was like a lot of yapping on my part. Now let's actually build our encoder and then we're gonna build our decoder. So first I'm just gonna create a variable called encoding underscore dim. And we're just going to set it equal to 10, which is freaking crazy. And then next we're going to have our input image, which is going to be equal to input with the shape being that 784. And again, you might not want to hard code this. You might want to do something like this, but for now I'll just set it like that. So now that we have the input, what we're going to do is we're going to make our encoding layers. So we're going to say encoded is equal to, and we're just going to use a dense neuron. And then in here, we'll just say 128 for the number of neurons. And we'll say activation is going to be equal to ReLU. And then here, of course, our input is the input image. Next, we're going to create another layer. So I'll just copy that, paste it. But instead of taking in the input image, it's taking in encoded. And we'll say we'll get it down to 64. And then we're gonna do it one more time. But this time it's going down to 32. This is our third layer. And then now for our encoded output, we'll say encoded output is going to be equal to dense and then the encoding dimension, which in this case is 10. And then we're gonna take in the encoded. And we're also going to add the activation function, which is going to be ReLU. So I'm going to run that. And now that I have that sorted out, we're going to build our decoder. So if you remember the images that I showed at the beginning of the video of the encoder and then the decoder, the decoder is basically just going to be the reverse of our encoder. 
And so all I'm going to do basically is just say decoded is equal to, and you see all we have to do is basically do the reverse where you have 32, 64, 128, and then our decoded output is going to be equal to that 784 or the original image size. And we'll just set that last layer to sigmoid uh, and then we'll say decoded. So now that we have our encoder and our decoder, it's time to put together our auto encoder. So we'll say auto encoder is equal to model. And then we'll say our input image and our decoded output. We'll run that. And then now let's compile our auto encoder. So we'll say auto encoder.compile. The optimizer that we're going to use is Atom, but we're gonna make a custom learning rate. So I'll say learning rate is equal to 0 0.001. And then we're gonna say binary cross entropy as the loss function. So we're gonna run that. So now that our model is compiled, it's time to actually train it. So I'll say autoencoder.fit. And we're just gonna fit the X train to each other. The epics, let's say 40 epics, batch size 256, that should be fine. We wanna make sure that we're shuffling the values and then that validation set that's gonna be checking how well we're doing as we go is gonna be the X tests that we created up here. So we're gonna start training our model and I'm gonna go answer the text that my boss just sent me. A few moments later. All right, so it looks like our model is done training, but we can see here that it hasn't improved a whole awful lot. So what you would need to do in this case is either make the neural network bigger, adjust the learning rate, something like that. A few moments later. All right, and it seems like our autoencoder has done just a little bit better with that 0 .0037 validation loss. Now what we're going to do is we are going to actually test out our autoencoder. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna set our encoded images equal to the autoencoder.predict and then our X test, and then our decoded images equal to the autoencoder.predict encoded images. So essentially what we have is we're gonna encode the images and then we're gonna take that and then put it into our decoder. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to compare our results. So we're going to compare the actual image that we have with the encoded and then decoded or the autoencoded images. And so in order to do that, I'm just gonna copy and paste some boilerplate matplotlib to sort of show you the comparison between example test images and then example autoencoded images so that you can see the difference. So we're gonna run that. Okay, everything looks good. And now we'll paste. And you see here, we're just creating some matplotlib, some plots of about 10 different numbers. And when we run this, You'll see on the top we have our original image. So this is the uh, not encoded or not auto encoded image, the, the test set. And then here we have the encoded and then decoded image. So you can see they still retain a lot of the same shape, albeit they are a little bit blurry. And in some of them, like for instance, this five right here really doesn't do well at kind of picking up what it's supposed to be. But other than that, you can see very clearly, you can even see little uh, distinct aspects of the handwriting that are being communicated here. And it's really, really cool because we're taking this big complex image and we're using an auto encoder to basically get it down to its bare essence. But yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments or if you want to roast me in the comments for how I did this, please do so down below. And I hope to see you in the next one. Sweet.